Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started for uh, for us here. Um, we'll be admitting people as we go along, but I want to take a minute to welcome everyone here. Uh, I'm glad that you're able to join us for this special webinar on gene therapy. Uh, we, uh, what we will be recording this, uh, so if you need to go back and revisit parts of it, you will be able to. And or if there's someone that you know that wasn't able to join us tonight that wanted to, they'll be able to access it. We should have it uh, up on uh, the CAF website within the next uh, next day or two. And hold on, just have to make a change there as I'm admitting people. And uh, we do have a, a packed program. And we want to have, make sure we have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So I'm going to get us started in just a moment. Just want to remind everyone that if you are a participant who is uh, not making a presentation, please uh, keep your yourself muted so that we can all hear what's going on. Uh, and we will be having a Q&A after the presentations are over. So what I will ask you to do, uh, please, if you can, is to put your questions in the chat box. If there's anyone who is not familiar with Zoom and how it works, if you look along, probably along the bottom of your screen, there are a number of uh, little icons and one of them should say chat. And if you click on that chat, it'll open up a little box and you would be able to send information to uh, to us with your the questions that you have, you can send them directly to me, or you can make it to for uh, to go to everyone. That's fine. But uh, as we go along, if you have questions, you can start putting them in there, and we will get to as many of them as we can. And having said that, I would now like to uh, turn things over to Dr. Sujit who is going to tell us uh, a little bit about the medical aspects of gene therapy. Uh, and we will then move on to a presentation from some people from Bluebird Bio who will talk specifically about what's going on with their recently FDA approved gene therapy process for thalassemia. So Dr. Shet. Thank you, Craig. I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, hello to my friends. Um, I. Uh, took the liberty of scanning through all the attendees, and I think I know quite a few people. So welcome to this um, webinar. I am really delighted and very excited to talk about this new advance that I think is going to completely start the revolution of treatments for thalassemia. As you know, until recently, we've only had allogeneic stem cell transplant as a curative therapy, but now we have one additional option and soon I think additional options as well. These are my disclosures. I am, I have consulted for Bluebird Bio and I am on the steering committee for CRISPR Vertex as well. So what we're gonna talk about is just some of the gene therapy approaches. We'll talk about some of the efficacy and safety data from the clinical trials. And then finally, just end with how to think about gene therapy as an option for you. So what are the things that you need to think about for yourself? How do you approach this? And how do you think about whether this is something that's right for you, whether this is something you want to do or not? So just in, to put it in context, when you have beta thalassemia, you have two mutations in the beta globin gene. These mutations are either beta zero or beta plus or beta E, and individuals have either beta zero, beta zero, or non-beta zero, beta zero. And this is going to be relevant when we talk about some of the results. Um, all of these individuals with both of these different, um, both of these types of thalassemia were included in the clinical trials. Um, individuals in general can be either TDT or NTDD, which just means transfusion-dependent thalassemia or non-transfusion-dependent thalassemia. And this therapy that we're going to talk about today for the most part, Zintegla, is approved for all genotypes in patients with transfusion-dependent thalassemia only. It is not approved for non-transfusion-dependent thalassemia. So these are different approaches for uh, gene therapy. So either you could add a gene 
um, and, and essentially put in a gene that is now able to function normally. Or you can edit the gene. So the gene that is mutated, you can edit it, or you can edit some other gene that then ends up having some sort of a, a, an effect that is beneficial to individuals with thalassemia. So as you know, if you have beta thalassemia, you don't make enough beta globin. There is an excess of alpha globin. You need something to bind to that to form hemoglobin, which will then carry oxygen. So the, the addition approach adds a beta or beta-like or gamma globin gene that produces gamma globin or beta globin that then binds to the alpha. And gene editing is, is an approach to either edit the gene that is defective, correct that defect, or edit another gene that affects the expression of gamma globin, so it produces gamma globin that can then bind to the alpha globin to make hemoglobin. Okay. So how is this done? Essentially, a, a patient's own stem cells are collected. Now keep in mind that, as I said, the only currently, or the only recent, until recently, the only available cure of therapy was an allogeneic transplant from a sibling or a relative. Um, and that involved collecting that person's stem cells and then infusing them into the patient. Where here you're collecting the patient's own defective stem cells, either from the bone marrow or through a peripheral collection by what we call apheresis. Then the hematopoietic stem cells are purified and these are then sent to the processing facility. This is where the magic happens. This is where either there's transduction, which means addition of the gene of interest to these stem cells, or there is editing of the genes in the stem cells itself. And then these stem cells that have been modified are then processed for quality and then stored away. These cells are then sent to the center where they are going to be infused into the individual. The patient is admitted to the hospital, receives chemotherapy to completely ablate, which is to completely kill your own bone marrow so as to make room for the new stem cells that are coming in. And then these stem cells are reinfused through a peripheral IV in some instances, or there's a trial in Italy where they introduce it directly into your bone marrow. So the first part of this, the stem cell collection happens as an outpatient. The reinfusion happens as an inpatient. And generally you're in the hospital for about six to eight weeks. And you'll hear more about this a little bit later. So essentially the timeline you can see on the left-hand side of the slide says your evaluate, you started with the evaluation, all of this, this processing evaluation, getting all of your lab work, getting your MRIs, et cetera, all of that takes a couple of months. And then when you're scheduled to have your stem cells collected, this will happen um, as an outpatient again, the stem cells are collected and then sent for processing to the lab. It would take approximately three months and the Bluebird folks will tell you exactly how long that's going to be. And then you get admitted to the hospital for about six weeks, get your cells back. And once they have engrafted or once they have gone to your bone marrow and started to produce um, red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets, then you're discharged. And then you can be followed as an outpatient. During that admission, you might require transfusions um, of red blood cells as well as platelets. And that's the time that you would get this chemotherapy. When you infuse these cells through an IV, they have a, a way of finding them their way to the bone marrow, and then they settle in and um, start, you know, start their new life there and start producing cells. So we're going to talk about some of the results of the, um, of the, the clinical trials. Um, and these are some of the factors that affect the outcome. Now, this is very important to think and think about because each individual um, has to think about these um, factors uh, for themselves, as well as um, you know when they're assessing whether things are going well or not, and if it's if it's going to be successful. You have to think about the severity of the complications of thalassemia prior to therapy. 
Is your liver working well? Are your kidneys working well? What is your heart health like? Because you don't want to go into a transplant, which is a pretty complicated procedure with, um, with, with abnormalities in those organ functions, because that will increase your risk of this not going exactly right. And then the other thing to think about is your iron overload status. So you want to be in the best possible shape as far as your iron overload is concerned, because the more iron overloaded you are, the worse off your liver is in terms of, of, of being able to function completely normally, as well as other organs as well. The degree of bone marrow ablation, so how effectively your bone marrow is completely killed off is important as well. And there are some approaches which have used a non-myeloablative uh, regimen. Um, this is more on the sickle cell side that is being done even currently on the thalassemia side. The regimen has been full bone marrow ablation or myeloablation. The dose of cells that you get back, and this is very important to keep in mind because this is, this is the responsibility of the, uh, of, of the stem cell collection, the processing, and then the quality control of the product that you receive. You have to get an adequate number of cells, as well as a high proportion of those cells need to be uh, um, either transduced or edited, which means that a large number or a large proportion of those cells needs to have the gene inserted in this case or edited, which is the other approach. And then the expression of the uh, modified gene to produce the desired globin, whether it's beta globin or gamma globin. And then we have to, we're still looking into whether or not your age at the time of this is, is really relevant or not. Um, in the clinical trials, they started with children in about six years and up um, and went all the way until age 50. Uh, we have to see, oh, actually 35 or 50, I'm not, I can't remember exactly, but, but they're different protocols. And so we have to think about, um, you know, and again, this comes down to the severity of your thalassemia complications prior to therapy as well. So these are the, the early phase two trials, which are 204 and 205 of the Bluebird product, so BB305. And this looked at, uh, th this had, there were two trials, 204 and 205, and this included patients with both of the genotypes the non-beta-0, beta-0, which is a little bit less severe because you make some beta-globin, as well as beta-0, beta-0. And you can see that 12 of 13 patients with non-beta-0, beta-0 thalassemia became transfusion independent. So remember, the goal of this gene therapy is to be able to stop transfusions completely. So you become transfusion independent and to have a reasonable hemoglobin level so that you're able to function fully and be able to do all of the things that you would normally be uh, wanting to do. So a normal, normal-ish hemoglobin level and um, a, a complete freedom from transfusions. So 12 of 13 non-beta-0, beta-0 patients were, became transfusion independent and three of nine beta zero, beta zero patients became transfusion dependent. Remember, these are the early studies. Even in the patients who did not become transfusion independent, there was a significant reduction in their transfusion requirement, as you can see from the graph on the right-hand side of the slide. So markedly decreased the blue bars are before the pr procedure, the gray bars are after the procedure. You can see that the number of transfusions went down quite dramatically in all of the patients who did not respond by becoming transfusion independent. Now, this is the pivotal phase three study upon which the results of which um, led to the approval of this therapy for, uh, by the FDA. And you can see here that um, you can see this is the age of the patients that were, were, um, were treated. And it, it goes all the way from four years of age up to 33 years of age. Uh, or 34 years of age. And you can see on the right-hand side, the hemoglobin level that was achieved after the process was completed. And you can see that most of these patients had somewhere between 10 or so grams of hemoglobin uh, or higher, but a few patients had a little bit lower as well. So bottom line, 32 of 36 patients were able to achieve transfusion independence. Um, 
Okay. And the, this is, this is a now a mean duration of about two years, a median duration of two years from all of the evaluable patients. And this is data cut off from March of 2021. So right now, if you did um, a data analysis, you would have a, over three or three and a half years worth of, of uh, follow-up data. But this data cutoff is, at, uh, is from March 2021. The median hemoglobin level at the end of all of this was 11.6 grams per deciliter. So you can see the dark blue lines are patients who became transfusion independent. You can see most of the patients became transfusion independent, except for these few patients who have the light blue who remained transfusion dependent as well, but with a reduction in transfusion requirement. Um, now this is, these are, these are two other studies. Um, uh, sorry, these are the same studies for um, the phase three studies, 2.7 and 2.12. But this is a breakout of the pediatric patients. And you can see again, um, the ages uh, are broken down as between 12 and 18 on the top, and then less than 12 at the bottom. And you can see the less than 12 range from four to 11, and the, the over 12 range from 12 to 17. And you can see that in the 12 to, to 18 age group, 11 of 11. So all of the patients were able to achieve transfusion independence with good hemoglobin levels somewhere between 11 and 13. So the median weighted hemoglobin was 11.6. Of the less than 12 year olds, 11 of 13 patients were able to achieve transfusion independence. Um, and again, this, the median duration is about two years and the weighted hemoglobin was 10. And this data is a little bit later. Cutoff is um, August 18th of last year. So one more year's worth of data is, is available that is being analyzed right now. So results overall are pretty good. 90% of the patients were able to achieve transfusion independence with um, good hemoglobin levels and a follow-up now that ranges from the earliest studies of about almost seven years to the more recent studies, which are now between three and four years out. And finally, I do want to also mention, and this is not an approved therapy, but there is another therapy. This is one of the gene editing approaches. Um, and this is the most recent data from that study that was presented in, uh, at uh, the European Congress in uh, June, where 44 patients have been given this gene edited product. Um, and at the time of evaluation, about half of them had achieved transfusion independence um, uh, that was assessed at 12 months, as you can see from the dotted red line. The others had, uh, of the others, most had achieved transfusion independence, but had not yet reached the 12 month mark. So they can't be considered to have actually been successfully treated. Now, the, uh, the other thing that we should talk about briefly is the risks of gene therapy. And this is something that, again, everybody has to take into account and think about for themselves. One is the toxicity of the chemotherapy itself. So the you, you have to get chemotherapy to ablate or to kill your own bone marrow. And that can lead to a lot of mucous membrane uh, irritation and breakdown. So in your mouth, in your throat, um, your skin, uh, you, can, you can have sloughing of the skin, there's hair loss. Um, and then you can also develop liver toxicity, including something that we call veno-occlusive disease. And this is something that, was, that is, is, is somewhat difficult to treat, but um, this happened early on. And so we learned from that and um, the trials then incorporated a prophylactic uh, regimen to prevent venoclusive disease from occurring. And since that was instituted, no, no further patients have developed this dreaded complication. You do have to worry about graft failure. So sometimes the graft for, for reasons that we don't always fully understand may not actually work. Sometimes it takes longer for the graft to start to, to function. That's called delayed engraftment. One of the toxicities of chemotherapy is that it is likely to make you infertile. So thinking about fertility preservation is important as well during this entire process. And then some of the other possible things that could happen 
are something called clonal dominance, where a particular clone of cells may become more dominant in your bone marrow. This may be may not be a normal uh, clone of cells, and that could could lead to problems down the road. Or the other fear, which we, we have not seen, at least in the thalassemia population, is insertional mutagenesis, which just means that this, this, this gene of interest is carried by a vector, which is a carrier virus called a lentivirus. And that can insert into the um, genome of your stem cell and it can cause problems. Or in the, in the instance of editing, it can, they, they can be off target editing, which can also cause problems as well. So far, we don't have any evidence of either of these two things in the gene therapy trials for thalassemia. So the safety profile to death, there've been no to, to date, sorry, no deaths so far. Most of the side effects were related to the conditioning chemotherapy and the transplant procedure itself. So fever, the mucositis I mentioned, occasional nosebleeds. Again, as I mentioned, venal occlusive disease was seen in some of the early patients and then not seen once prophylaxis was instituted. No patients to date have developed dysplasia, which is that clonal dominance, or leukemia, which is a fear from the insertional mutagenesis. So no episodes of insertional mutagenesis or off-target editing as of yet. So we have long enough data now to feel quite confident that this is not likely to be an issue, but we don't know for sure, which is why the FDA has mandated 15 years of follow-up for individuals who undergo uh, gene therapy. And so this data will be collected and continue to be collected on the patients who've already been treated and will then be collected prospectively on patients who start, um, who get the therapy what, as an approved therapy in the um, clinical arena as well. So when you think about yourself or your child, think about your age and think about what complications you have related to thalassemia, heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, or pulmonary disease. These would make you higher risk for a procedure like an uh, autologous stem cell transplant. Your iron overload status must be considered organ function, heart, liver, kidney. Have you had a, had a transplant before that didn't work? Second transplants are oftentimes more complicated and more risky uh, than the first one. So if you've had one already, this may, be, um, may not be something that you wanna to, 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 to do because you're getting another dose of another round of chemotherapy, which can make, um, which can increase your risk for developing things like a secondary malignancy or something else like that. Fertility preservation, you have to think about, do you already have a family? How do you do fertility preservation in children? Uh, this differs if you're, uh, if, if you're pre-puberty or post-puberty. Um, so things like that you have to think about. And then the, the total duration of time that this is going to take. It's gonna take, you know, from the time you get admitted to the hospital to get start your process, to, through the engraftment process, through the follow-up, about nine months or so. So you have, to, you have to think about, you know, how are you going to take nine months away from school or from, from your job and all of the things that, that surround that. You know, so after the transplant for the first few months, you have to be very, very careful about getting infections. So you have to stay away from people who are sick um, and, you know, this, this may be relevant if you have young children who go to school and stuff like that. So you have to think about all of these different things when you're thinking about yourself and, you know, or your child and how this may or may not be um, something that you would be considering. So I think that's the last slide. No, this is the conclusions. Transfusion independence in patients who receive gene therapy, the success rate is comparable with allogeneic stem cell transplant. Uh, about 90% um, transfusion independence and success. So far, the transfusion independence has been very durable, which means patients, once they became transfusion independence, ind independent, very rarely uh, did they uh, lose the graft and become transfusion dependent again. Most of the side effects are related to the transplant procedure itself. No dysplasia or leukemia and thalassemia patients to date. 
but it is a complex process and there are many variables to consider. It is likely that you would have better results in younger children and those without many complications of the disease already. And I think that's where I'm going to stop and hand it over to the Bluebird folks to tell you more about the actual nitty gritty of the process itself. Thank you very much, Dr. Shep. We appreciate that. I am going to hand things over now to Elsa Levita, who is the Re Director of Patient Advocacy for Bluebird Bio. Uh, just before Elsa gets started, I'm just going to remind uh, uh, people who came in a little bit late that we are recording this and it will be available for viewing uh, within the next day or two on the CAF website. So if you missed the first part of it, you will be able to uh, catch up on it uh, there. And uh, Elsa, please take it away. Thank you, Craig. And um, before we jump in, I just wanted to thank Coolies for the opportunity to be here tonight with you all to talk about Zintegro, and also to thank all of the patients and families and advocates and clinicians who supported the clinical research who made the approval of Zintegro possible. Um, this is a milestone that is more than a decade in the making. So we are so grateful for the support that the community has offered on the many, many years of research that has brought us to this point today. So I, um, I am joined tonight by three colleagues from Bluebird, and we will be talking about the treatment process along with some important safety information and Ami Tura from our medical affairs team will take us through that portion of the presentation. Then we will talk about Bluebird's Qualified Treatment Center Network, where Zintegra will be available. And Cindy Stockdale from our market access team will take us through that. And then we'll talk about Bluebird's patient services program, which is called My Bluebird Support with Lee Liberator, who leads the patient services team. Um, and just a note that tonight we are not able to offer um, medical advice to individuals, but do recommend that you reach out to your healthcare team to talk about those specific questions. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ami. Thank you, Elsa. Um, I want to echo what Elsa said. Thank you, Coolies, for um, inviting us. This is, this is a very exciting time. Um, as you all know, Zintaglo, as you all know, Zintaglo was approved on August 17th. So as Elsa said, we want to thank the study participants and the families. This approval would not have happened without them. Um, to Elsa's point, this has been a decade long journey. Our first patient was enrolled in clinical studies in 2013. Um, I want to start reviewing the details in the patient information within what we refer as US prescribing information. So, and I'm, I'm gonna sort of call at, you know, US, US prescribing information as USPI moving forward. So the USPI sets out agreed usage of the drug. Um, this section is based on the discussion and approval uh, for, between Bluebird Bio and the FDA and contains information in a very simple language so this helps patient to understand um, and use drugs safely and effectively. And as you would see, this is in a typical Q&A format. So the first thing is what is Zintegla? Um, Zintegla is a one-time gene therapy to treat beta thalassemia, also known as beta thalassemia major or Coolies anemia in patients who require regular transfusions. Um, and as Dr. Shed um, provided excellent overview and mentioned, um, this is across all genotypes and across all ages as well. Um, beta thalassemia, as Dr. Shed explained, is caused by change in beta globin gene, which causes the body to produce reduce or no beta globin. So Zintaglo is made specifically for each patient using the patient's own blood stem cells and hence it is referred to as autologous transplant. Um, it adds functional copies of beta globin gene to your cells. So it's highly individualized. Um, this may allow you to produce sufficient hemoglobin to stop receiving regular transfusions. 
I also want to review the important safety information. So um, first thing is some of the most common side effects of Zintegla. Um, what is listed here is on the day of treatment with Zintegla and what is uh, following treatment for up to six months. Um, on the day of the treatment, um, expect increased heart rate or abdominal pain and following treatment for up to six months, it could be low levels of platelets, which may reduce the ability to, for the blood to clot and may cause some bleeding. Low levels of white blood cells, which may make you more susceptible to infection. And lastly, pain in arms or legs. If you go to the next slide, Elsa. Also, um, in addition to um, those safety uh, listings, please call your healthcare provider if you have a new or unusual bleeding, which may include uh, some of the signs and symptoms listed here. You may also experience side effects associated with other medicines administered as a part of Zintegro treatment regimen uh, with Dr. Shet walkthrough, and we'll, we'll go through um, again in a few slides. Talk to your physician regarding any other any of those possible side effects. Um, your physician may give you other medicines to treat those side effects. Lastly, it is important for you to be monitored at least yearly for at least 15 years for any changes to your blood. There is a potential risk of blood cancer associated with this treatment. However, no cases have been seen in the studies with Zintegla. If you are diagnosed with cancer, you have have your treating physician contact Bluebird Bio at this number. Um, a patient receiving Zintegla should avoid donating blood, organs, tissues, or cells. Um, what additional possible or reasonable likely side effects of Zintegla can you expect? The first one is Zintegla will not give you um, HIV infection. However, treatment with Zintegla may cause a false positive test uh, result by some commercial test. So you need an HIV test. Talk to your healthcare provider about the appropriate test to use. These are not all the possible side effects which we discussed. Please call your doctor or for medical advice about the side effects you are encouraged to report negative side effects of prescription drugs also to the FDA. Um, lastly, just um, the general information is, it's important to have a regular checkups with your healthcare provider, including at least annual blood test to detect any adverse effects and to confirm that Zintegla is still working. Um, talk to your healthcare provider about any other concerns. So this is, this is the detail which is available to you. It is part of the US prescribing information, but we wanted to make sure you know, we, we walk through all the details before we go into the treatment process. So Dr. Shed went through um, the treatment process. Um, we'll, we'll walk through again. It's just a different way, and this is a highly complicated process. So, um, let me walk through with some visuals here. Uh, this is an overview of how the treatment pathway will look like. Um, step one, moving from the left. Um, so Zintiglosins is made specifically for you. Uh, your blood stems will be collected um, by a process called mobilization and apheresis. So that is step one. And then if you move down at the bottom, um, your blood stem cells will be sent to the manufacturing site where they are used to make Zintegla. Um, we'll get to the timeline in the next slide, but I just want to give you an overview of the steps. Before you receive Zintegla, your healthcare provider will give you chemotherapy or also known as conditioning uh, for a few days. So this is important to make a room in your bone marrow. Um, you will be admitted to the hospital for this step and remain in the hospital till Zintegla infusion. Um, Zintegla is given via IV infusion. Um, more than one bag could be required. Once the drug product has a time to establish in your bone marrow, 
the reconstituted red blood cells will produce the adult hemoglobin, which comes from the zintaglo. Um, this hemoglobin could be tracked because you know it has a certain change. So we could track and measure the level um, and see if zintaglo is working. Um, after receiving zintaglo, uh, 15 year follow up, um, the patient would enroll in 15 year follow up study. This is uh, it's encouraged but this registry study is voluntary. So this goes through, this is a high level overview of the timeline of the different steps we went through in the previous slide. Um, what we want to do is just break down into pre-treatment and the treatment and post-treatment section. Uh, please note that this time frames are meant only as an approximate guideline. The journey may look different uh, depending on the individual circumstances unique to each patient and their care team um, at the qualified treatment center. So um, Cindy will talk more about qualified treatment center. So what happens at the first step um, is the, as a part of pre-treatment, your cells will be collected through mobilization, through mobilization and apheresis. And mobilization typically takes five to six days, followed by apheresis for two to three days. This happens at QTC, and the cells are now sent for manufacturing. So that is, and that typically takes around 70 to 90 days, but the patient is waiting at home for this and not at QTC. For the treatment, once um, Zinteglo is manufactured, it is delivered at the QTC. Um, patient undergoes chemotherapy. Um, this takes approximately four days. Um, after that, there is a rest period for around at least 48 hours. Zinteglo infusion happens after that, um, and infusion takes around 30 minutes per bag. Uh, your healthcare uh, provider will keep you in the hospital for monitoring for, for post-infusion for around three to six weeks. Again, keep in mind, these are approximate timeline. Um, lastly, um, at, you know, the follow-up would happen at the doctor's office and you would be asked to enroll into a 15-year registry uh, for follow-up. This registry is something, it's a product registry and it's supported by Bluebird Bio. So with that, I will pass on to Cindy um, to discuss more on Qualified Treatment Center. And these steps are something which I walk through in the different slides, but this is a part of a patient information included within the US prescribing information. But we went through um, all the four steps. Can you hear me now? Sorry, I'm on my phone. Can yes, Pamela, can yes, you okay. hear you? Okay, good evening. Um, Zintegla will be administered only at qualified treatment centers, which are specialized hospitals that have expertise in areas including beta thalassemia, blood stem cell transplant, and cell and gene therapy. There's a stepwise onboarding process that QTCs go through before they are ready to treat patients because of the specialized nature of gene therapy and because these centers are actually part of the manufacturing process. Some of this training depends on the final label and can only begin following FDA approval. A site is not truly activated and we cannot share their information publicly until all of these pieces are complete. This is one reason why we are bringing our QTCs on in waves over the course of this fall. And we look forward to communicating more about our QTC network as more sites are activated in the near term. This approach is intended to support a high level of care and will allow us to create a network that balances expertise and community needs with the operational complexity associated with gene therapy. What you see on the heat map on the right are areas of the United States that have a high number of TDT patients. 
In addition to the criteria I mentioned previously, this is a factor in our selection of these key TCs. Our goal is to ensure we are placing centers where patients are already receiving care. So this shows you where people with TDT are located. And on the next slide, I will show you where our current QTCs are located. I do want to mention that we will continuously update our list of activated QTCs and hope to have our online locator posted soon. In the meantime, we will work very closely with Cooley's Foundation and our Patient Support Center, which is called My Bluebird Support, to provide the most current information. Next slide, please. We are very excited about our initial QTC network, which includes Boston Children's Hospital, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, also known as CHOP, Cohen Children's Medical Center, and Texas Children's Hospital, represented here with the Blue Stars. In addition, we anticipate activating our first QTCs on the West Coast and the Midwest in the coming weeks, and expect this network will grow to the low double digits by the end of the year. And as I mentioned, as we continue to add sites in the coming weeks, my Bluebird support will be able to provide more information and ongoing support and answer questions. Now I will turn it over to Lee to go more in depth on my Bluebird support. Thank you, Cindy. Good evening, everybody. And thank you again for allowing us to speak with you tonight and share our information. As Cindy mentioned, my name is Lee, and I lead the patient support program, which is called My Bluebird Support. This program is designed to help patients understand and seamlessly access our therapies, including Zintegro, and it offers personalized services and guidance through programs that cover education, insurance questions, and treatment journey support. We're also here to answer questions from doctors and the QTCs regarding insurance coverage for the enrolled patients and caregivers. So we'll help you and we'll also help your doctors. This is led by a patient navigator and the patient navigator is a person who has knowledge and deep experience about Bluebird Bio's gene therapy, as well as a support specialist who can help make use of the, of the services that my Bluebird support Enrollment in My Bluebird Support to discuss program offerings is easy. All you have to do is call the phone number at the bottom of the slide, and they will provide you with a form that you can sign easily over your with your computer or over your phone or your iPad, and you send it back in order to give us consent to investigate or, or verify your insurance benefits. Once you do that, there will be a review of which QTC will be appropriate from an insurance standpoint, and then you and your doctor can talk a little bit more about what is right for you medically and clinically. And then from there, you let us know which QTC you would like to be treated at, and we will provide the contact information for the appropriate members of that QTC team. And with that, I just want to reiterate that we recognize that some of the tools on mybluebirdsupport.com are not quite live, like the very popular and, and long anticipated QTC locator. We should have them in the coming days and weeks uploaded, as well as a really great brochure called the Consideration Brochure that will outline a lot of the information that we reviewed this evening and more and would be a really great guide to bring to an appointment with your doctor in order to review and, and ask and answer all of the questions that you may have about Zintegra. So keep checking back on the website. I know it can be a little frustrating when the information isn't there, but we're, we're coming along each and every day with new and important information. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Bluebird, very much. We appreciate all of that. I'm going to spotlight uh, our speakers so that we can have them available as we choose some questions here. Uh, and I will start off um, just by saying that we had a, a number, we'll, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, and if we can't get to them all, we'll see what we can do about trying to get uh, answers afterwards. But one of the first questions that was asked uh, was a question about, <coughs> excuse me, 
if um, if there had this this was approved for transfusion dependent thalassemia. There was some question about have there been trials in non transfusion dependent thalassemia already, and if so, what were the results like? Uh, and uh, does Bluebird have any intention of at some point trying to uh, get this approved for non transfusion dependent thalassemia? So uh, I'm not sure, uh, Dr. Sheth, I don't know if you have any information on anything involving trials with non-transfusion dependent thalassemia or not. So as far as I know, there have not been any trials um, that the FD, uh, uh, FDA has approved even to get started with in non-transfusion, any gene therapy trials in non-transfusion dependent patients. They want to get the most severe patients treated first, and these are the transfusion dependent patients. And then, as is typical with many of the other therapies with thalassemia, the spatercept, um, the pivot, et cetera, first, first trialed in transfusion-dependent patients, and then um, if all goes well, then maybe trans, uh, um, studied in uh, non-transfusion-dependent patients as well. But so far, right now, no. Thank you. Uh, Bluebird, is there anything that you would like to add to that? Uh, Craig, yeah, Dr. Shed covered it. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. We also had a question from someone who was wondering if diet had any impact on the, uh, the results or if there is any uh, special diet that needs to be followed for someone that would be wanting to undergo uh, the process. Uh, do we have any opinions? No, on diet has no impact. Uh, the only thing that I will say is while you are immunocompromised and while you are in the transplant procedure itself, um, your food will be, you will not be able to eat fresh vegetables um, and, and fresh fruits because um, of the potential for contamination and developing an infection. Um, so that is a period of time when you will have to really make do with the hospital food, which will be treated appropriately so that your um, you're protected from those risks. Uh, again, this is only during the period when your immune system is severely compromised. But once that period is passed, you can start to eat everything. And there was also a question from someone wondering if uh, having the spleen removed has an impact on eligibility or uh, outcome. No. Okay. Uh, we have a question uh, from someone who wants to know, are they supposed to wait for a patient navigator to tell them where to go, or can they just schedule a consultation with a qualified treatment center? I'll let the blue we'll folks that that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. There is no need to wait if you have an interest in moving forward with reaching out to one of the qualified treatment centers, please go ahead and do so. If you're looking for some contact information, please reach out to my Bluebird support so that we can provide that information to the right people within the treatment center so that you can have a seamless conversation. Thank you. Uh, and we had a number of questions from people who really are, are just curious about what, what is known at this point about insurance, uh, if, you know, do, uh, is there anything that can be uh, can be said at this point about uh, how insurance coverage may or may not work? Uh, I'll take that one. Yes, so we've been in um, long-standing conversations with the top insurance companies in the United States for the last two plus years. And we started out with disease education, trying to just uh, let them know about the critical unmet need and just to uh, engage with them. There has been a ton of excitement and engagement from the payers, and um, we've had a couple of agreements that I, I know have been in the press where we have signed, and we have not met resistance from them. They really do understand um, that this is a really important novel approach, and uh, we've, it's just been an overall positive situation. I can't speak to specifics because each insurance is different for each patient, and it's going to be determined by what that patient's insurance is. But from a payer standpoint, they are well educated on it, and they are very engaged. Great, thank you. Uh, we have someone who asked, has the follow-up been long enough after gene therapy to be confident that there are no clonal dominance or insertional mutagenesis? Uh, I don't know, Dr. Sheth, if you feel that's something you can address. 
Sure. So, so I, again, um, we have now a good amount of data, um, five years to seven years worth of data from the most initial studies, um, the 204, uh, 204 and 205 studies. Um, and so far, there is not, there has not been any concern for insertion mutagenesis in the thalassemia population. Again, whether or not this will continue to hold or not is anybody's guess, which is why long-term follow-up is absolutely critical to ensure that surveillance is able to be performed fully and that we're able to, to keep track of individuals who have gone through this. And therefore, if you do go through with this, you absolutely should. It's a very strong recommendation of mine to be enrolled in the surveillance follow-up study for 15 years. So that this, this you know, that, that it does involve getting tested on a periodic basis to look for insertion mutagenesis and things like that. So this is something that absolutely should be, should be done. But so far, um, you know, can I say that there's, that enough time has passed that we can say for sure that nobody's gonna develop this? No, um, but you know, the, the results so far are very encouraging that so far after all these months and years of follow-up, nobody has developed any uh, insertional mutagenesis or a clonal disease uh, to date. Great, thank you. And we had a question from someone asking what kind of testing is done to pre-qualify a transfusion dependent thalassemia patient for Zantaglo treatment? Um, that, that's just, it, you know, it's similar to, to undergoing any kind of transplant. You, you would have to assess your liver function, your kidney function, your cardiac function, your pulmonary function, um, just to make sure that all of your organs are in the best possible shape so that you can, you know, anticipate if you're going to have complications or not. Um, there's a question about diabetes as well. And no, diabetes doesn't preclude you from getting this, but, you know, it does, as with, with anything else, diabetes will increase the risk of complications, you know, especially things like infections that you might, you might be more prone to because you have diabetes, uh, especially during that period of time when you are severely neutropenic and immunocompromised. Um, so it really does, uh, it, it's important that you're in the best possible shape. And so the evaluations will include all of that to look at your organ function, to look for complications of thalassemia, to look for complications of iron overload, um, assess your iron status, your cardiac function, et cetera. And we had someone who was asking, uh, do we know what the percentage of patients is who have currently signed up for the 15 year follow-up? So we have not, um, so Zintaglo was approved on August 17th, right? So we have still established in the QTCs, we have still not treated patient in US. Um, so we'll, but as Dr. Shed said, we highly encourage patients to enroll in the registry and follow for 15 years. But right now we, you know, we still don't have any patients enrolled. Thank you. And uh, someone was curious, what are the precautions that need to occur after the discharge from the hospital? What limitations are there until normal activities can be resumed? So again, the most important thing is to not get an infection while your immune system is reconstituting. So there was a question about you know, uh, COVID-like protocols for eight to 12 months. Well, your immune system um, after an auto autologous transplant may recover a little bit better than after an allogeneic transplant, but, or, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's not particularly different. Um, but yes, you have to take precautions because you're going to be uh, immunocompromised. And so, you know, not getting sick, not being exposed to somebody who has an infection is absolutely, absolutely critical because if you do get a severe infection, you can have significant complications, including an impact on the graft itself. So you have to really be very careful uh, not to get an infection. Thank you. And I've had a, a number of questions asking about cost and availability in India. And I'll just take uh, the liberty to go ahead and say that, unfortunately, this discussion can only answer questions about uh, what's going on in the U.S. because that's where it has been approved. Uh, there's not approval in India at this point. So uh, there really, I don't think, would be any uh, specific information uh, like that. Uh, available at this point. There also was a question about, is there any reason to think that a patient who is on or has been on uh, loose patercept uh, would not be eligible for uh, gene therapy? 
Now, you'd be eligible for gene therapy, but you'd have to stop the Luspatacept for a period of time before um, your stem cells can be collected because remember, Luspatacept has an effect on the bone marrow and on the stem cells. So you'd have to be off Luspatacept um, until it's completely washed out of your body before they would um, give you the, um, the mobilizing agents and then be able to collect your stem cells. So I'm going to say preferably six months um, off of Luspatacept uh, before you can, uh, um, again, this is, this is not, you know, I don't think there is any specific guideline to this, but I'm, I, I'm just saying that, you know, it takes about three months for the effect to completely leave your body. And I would give it a little bit more time to make sure that there isn't any residual effect um, on your stem cells or, or your differentiating cells uh, before we collect them for uh, the processing. Thank you. Uh, and someone asked if a patient's original stem cells are, are saved in the event that engraftment fails or for perhaps for any, any seen any use uh, for years later, if there seems to be a, a need for those stem cells. So again, the stem cells, so a, a proportion of the stem cells that are collected will be stored away as is, not modified with gene therapy. And then a proportion of them will be modified with gene therapy and then sent to be reinfused. So the cells that are held in reserve are unmodified cells, not additional modified cells. So if you do have to get those back because the graft fails and then you don't have a functioning bone marrow, then you would get those cells back again, your own cells, again, unmodified, and then you would go back to needing regular transfusions because these are unmodified cells. Correct me if I'm saying anything out of place, um, Ami. No, no, you're, you're correct, Dr. Thank you. And we had a, a number of questions, uh, specific questions about the, the whole issue of the effect on fertility. And I think that uh, the best thing uh, to say in, in that regard is that if you have questions about this and about what the biselfane conditioning might uh, cause, it's, it's really a good idea to speak to your physician and to speak to someone who is an expert uh, in fertility issues uh, so that they could really go into detail and give you much more information about that uh, than I think anyone on this, this call would be able to. Uh, there was also was a question if there was any common trend found in the patients that didn't become transfusion independent? The, in, the, in the more recent studies, the only thing that I can recall from the data was that these individuals had a relatively low vector copy number, which means the proportion of cells that were transduced with the desired um, gene through the, with, with the lentiviral vector that number was relatively a little bit on the low side. Um, and the, since then, the company has um, changed its, its release criteria to have a higher threshold. So you want to be sure that you have above a certain proportion of cells that are transduced, and that should um, mitigate this, this, this uh, issue. Good. All right, we're we're coming to the end of our webinar. I just wanted to throw it throw it out to pre our presenters to ask if there's anything else that you feel uh, needs to be said before we say good night. Any last messages that you feel we need to leave for anyone? Thank you for sharing your evening with us. We appreciate it. Well, we appreciate all of you uh, coming here and giving us your expertise. Thank you, Craig. And, and, and again, thank you to the Kalisina Foundation, because I think the, thing, the stuff that you do for, uh, as, as advocates for our patients is tremendous, and we are all very grateful. Thank you. And we appreciate seeing everyone tonight. I hope this was informative. And as I said, we'll have it available as a recording so you can go back over and uh, catch what you may have missed or uh, needed refreshing on. And thank you again to our presenters. This has been wonderful. And everyone have a very good evening.